When I was reading chapter 12 on preaching in Bonaventure's Major Life of St. Francis, I had one thought. How do I become better? How do I become a better preacher? I thought this chapter would give me keys to successful preaching. I was looking for tips and tricks, something I could use like a step-by-step -step guide or some kind of outline, right? Instead, I get these sort of childish stories about Francis talking to birds. Then I realized Francis, unlike myself, was not solely concerned about getting better, leaving his sinful life and reforming his ways. He was concerned with God's will. In the beginning of the chapter, we find Francis caught in a dilemma. Should he pray or should he preach? He goes back and forth with this. He knows that prayer is where he's purified, where he becomes united with God. However, God did come down to earth to instruct others by his preaching. So both had the pros and cons, and he didn't know what he should do. Bonaventure writes, Francis was not ashamed to ask advice in small matters from those under him. As long as he lived, this was his highest philosophy and his highest desire, to ask from the wise and the simple, the perfect and the imperfect, the young and the old, how he could more effectively arrive at the summit of perfection. Francis's main endeavor was to please God, through which he was able to accomplish great things. Bonaventure says that when Francis forgets his words before preaching to the Pope and the Cardinals, he calls out to the Holy Spirit and magically starts to speak eloquently. When he, he, when he needs to heal someone, he makes the sign of the cross, and they are miraculously healed. And when he wanted to preach to the people, but the birds were chirping too loudly, he invited the birds to listen to his preaching, and that silenced them. In everything Francis did, he kept God in the focus. <coughs> but how often do we do the same? When we set out to do something, how often are we thinking about God? In a culture where we are told that we are the authors of our own lives, where we are the sole responsible parties of change, we are conditioned to do things alone. We have this internal recording in our head saying, I have to figure this out. I have to get this done. I have to make the situation better. Or I have to make myself better. There's no reaching out to others because that would expose our faults. And there's no reaching out to God because we are continually told by society, we can do it. Be all you can be. Just do it. But what happens when the outcome isn't what we wanted? I've been reading this book by the psychologist David Burns, and, was, and he was caught in a sort of similar dilemma. Some days he would be in session with his clients, and they would praise him profusely, saying he was the best therapist ever. And then other days, not so much. They would probably get into a fight sometimes. And David would beat himself up over each, each session where he deemed it unsuccessful, wondering constantly what he did wrong and how he could be better. Although trying to become better was a good thing, he realized one thing. He could not control how his clients would react to his words. Trying to do so would be futile. Therefore, instead of focusing on what he said, or what the client's response was, he focused on his intention. He asked if he put the same amount of care in this session as he did in the last one. So brothers, we can work very hard, but we are never in control of our situation. We can control, however, how much effort we put into determining God's will asking the young and the old, the simple and the wise, and the perfect and the imperfect, what would be most pleasing to God. After all, God can make all things happen. This chapter functions as a great reminder of God's power. There are countless accounts of him healing people from all over, but even more bizarre are the accounts of him telling the birds to be quiet while he's preaching, and even a time when he commands a boat to move on command. Bonaventure writes, By his remarkable power, not only creatures lacking reason learned obedience, but even inanimate objects served him when he preached as if they had life. 
So I had to go about this in my analytical mode. On a literal level, the miracles are incredible works that happen outside of natural law. On a symbolic level, they convey one thing, the all-encompassing power of God. This chapter does so in a hyperbolic way. It basically says that God's power is so great that it converts the stubborn. God's power is so great that it heals the sick. God's power is so great that it controls animals, and God's power is so great that it even makes boats move. <coughs> In a world where we are told to be the authors of our change, Bonaventure colorfully reminds us that God is the one really capable of change. And Francis knew this intimately. So brothers, one of the biggest lies we can tell ourselves is that we are in control of everything. We can fool ourselves by creating things or getting things done in a consistent fashion, thus fooling ourselves that we can do so 100% of the time. But no one can do something 100% of the time. LeBron James does not make every shot. Adele does not always sing on key. And my cookies are definitely not great all the time. Therefore, we should not seek the ability to preach well. We should not seek the ability to heal. We sh but we should seek one thing, the will of God. So in a way, we are still asking the question, how do I become better? But instead, as Franciscans, we should add one modifier to that recording in our head of how to become better. Instead, we should say, how do I become better at serving the Lord? <laughs>